Welcome to the History Guy Podcast, a podcast dedicated to stories of lesser-known historical events told by Lance Geiger, also known as the History Guy on YouTube. I'm Josh, your host, a writer for the channel and eldest son of the History Guy. We tell all kinds of stories about history, from the modern era to the ancient past, so you never know what we're going to talk about next. One thing you can be sure of, it is history that deserves to be remembered. On today's episode, the History Guy tells histories that we didn't learn in school. First, he tells the history of the term continent, and how our understanding of how many and even what a continent is has changed over time. Then he looks deep into the past to answer an age-old question. Why are there seven seas, and which seas are they? Without further ado, let me introduce the History Guy. If you are from the United States, it's likely that you are taught that there are seven continents on this earth, but other parts of the world teach a six-continent model, either combining Europe and Asia into Eurasia or North and South America into simply America. It might surprise you to find out that the five rings of the Olympic flag represent a six-continent model. Those five rings represent the five inhabited continents, but deliberately exclude Antarctica. And setting aside the fact that geographers still disagree over how many continents there are, the term itself has ancient origins that have long impacted world politics and science and education. And the modern understanding of the term has only coalesced in the surprisingly recent era. The continents themselves might be very old, but the human understanding and definition of them is, well, history that deserves to be remembered. The term continent and its original social and scientific definition had a lot to do with the part of the world where those ideas were first formulated. It was the ancient Greeks who would have the greatest influence on the modern conception of continent. The term itself comes from a Greek word meaning landmass or terra firma. It was originally the proper name for the region in the northwest of Greece, the land of Epirus. Early Greek mariners sailing the Aegean saw their civilization and their trade as the center of the world. They essentially divided the world into two parts, Europe and Asia, separated by waterways. From the Aegean Sea, north through the Dardanelles, the Sea of Marmara, the Bosporus, the Black Sea, and north into the Sea of Azov. It was slightly later that the Greeks added a third piece of the world to that conception, that of Libya, which we now know as Africa. The Greeks sat in a unique position in this conception, and in fact it was not perfectly clear if they existed within the scheme at all. Some Greeks didn't identify themselves as Europeans at all, instead of using that term to refer to non-Greek states like Thracia. Another conception suggested that mainland Greece was part of Europe, but not the islands or the Peloponnesus. Aristotle went further, claiming that the Greeks existed outside of the continental concept altogether, and that they represented a middle position. These initial conceptions were limited, at least partially, by how little the Greeks knew about the inland parts of most of these regions. And their use of the term continent generally only referred to the regions near the shore. And if anyone thinks that our arguments over whether Europe should be regarded as its own continent is a modern disagreement, Herodotus criticized the idea in the 5th century BC, writing that the boundaries of Europe are quite unknown, and that for my part I cannot conceive why three names should ever have been given to a tract, which in reality is one, referring to Europe, Asia, and Libya. Later, the geographer Strabo was also critical of the scheme and wrote that in giving names to the three continents, the Greeks did not take into consideration the whole habitable earth, but merely their own country and the land exactly opposite. The true extents of these continents were unknown, and in fact the Greeks never understood them quite like we do today. As knowledge expanded, so did the size of the continents. Exact boundaries were also shifting. The boundary between Europe and Asia was never firmly agreed upon and was alternatively viewed as following from the Black Sea along the Rioni River that flows through Georgia, as was preferred by Herodotus, or along the Don River to the north, as preferred by geographer Strabo. Similarly, the boundary between Africa and Asia was uncertain, usually set at the Nile River. Herodotus thought it was ridiculous to divide the country between continents, and instead suggested that the continental boundary should sit on the western boundary of Egypt. The Romans continued to use the scheme in an informal way, and had provinces called Asia in modern Turkey and Africa along the coast of that continent. Europe as a concept held more meaning, exemplified in Pliny describing Europe as the nursling of the people that conquered all the nations and by far the most beautiful of lands. Geographical maps like that of Claudius Ptolemy invented the antecedents to modern latitude and longitude lines. 
His contention that Africa and Asia were linked by a land enclosing the Indian Ocean would continue to appear on maps for centuries afterwards. The fall of the empire would not bring down the three-continent scheme, which, especially in Europe, took on greater scholarly importance. The Middle Ages saw Europe work to find the continents within the Bible, which is not mentioned them at length, if at all. St. Jerome, who translated the Vulgate Bible, would write that Noah gave each of his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, one of the three parts of the world for their inheritance, and these were Asia, Africa, and Europe, respectively. This was important because it gave this conception of continents a religious significance, and additionally allowed contemporaries to explain why Asia was larger than the other two continents. Shem was the eldest son. Medieval Muslim cartographers did not make such distinctions. This led to the most common form of medieval European maps, T and O maps, first described in the 7th century by Isidore of Seville, who wrote that the earth may be divided into three sides. Europe is divided from Africa by the sea, and Asia is divided from Libya with Egypt by the Nile. In medieval cartography, the T was understood to be the Mediterranean Sea, the Nile River and the Don River, and the O represented the encircling ocean. Reflecting the religious nature of these maps, Jerusalem was usually depicted at its center, with east depicted on the upper portion where modern maps placed north, and Eden placed at the top of the map, nearest to heaven. These maps are often difficult to parse, owing in part to the period's profoundly theological view of space. They were not especially useful for actually finding one's way. Unlike some Greek geographers, the Middle Ages generally saw it as a gospel that the Nile separated Africa from Asia. Renaissance and medieval writers turned to the ancients as authorities, with 16th century geographer Sebastian Munster writing of the ancient division of the Old World into three regions separated by the Don, Mediterranean, and the Nile. It wasn't irrelevant either that Christendom seemed to fit neatly into the Greek conception of Europe. Increasing secularism and humanism additionally led cultures in that Christendom to seek a secular identity, and the 15th century saw Christians of the former Western Roman Empire begin to identify as Europeans. It isn't surprising that these increasingly foundational conceptions of the continents faced significant disruption on the discovery of the Americas. It would take time for European authors to even address the issue, with a popular 1555 French geographical text omitting any mention of the Americas at all. Professor Walter Mignolio argues that the Spanish denied the Americans continental status even longer. The Castilian notion of the Indies remained in place up to the end of the colonial empire. America began to be employed only toward the end of the 18th century. This was despite the fact that the Universalis Cosmographia in 1507 showed America separate from Asia. The Cosmographia is also the first to apply the name America to that land. Amerigo Vespucci wrote in 1502 or 1503 that I have discovered a continent in those southern regions. It wasn't until the 17th century that virtually all global geographies acknowledged the Americas as one of the four quarters or four corners of the world. America in the west, Asia in the east, Europe in the north, and Africa in the south. The first modern atlas, the theater of the world, appeared in 1570. The author, Abraham Ortelius, was the first person known to suggest that the continents had once been connected before drifting apart. Greater accuracy and new ideas led to a reconsideration of what actually constituted a continent. It was only in the early modern period that the modern separation of Africa and Asia at the Suez Isthmus came to dominate. This also began the ongoing issue of separating Asia and Europe. The Don River clearly didn't reach anywhere close to the Arctic region. Some scholars extended the division along other rivers like the Volga, but it was the 18th century that saw Swedish military officer Philipp Johann von Stallenberg argue that the Ural Mountains were the logical barrier, a theory reinforced by the Russians, who were ideologically attempting to tie themselves to Europe and not Asia. The separation of Siberia was again a key part of the ideological puzzle, allowing what the Russians began calling the Great Tartary of the Eastern Land to be suitable for colonial rule. Argument remained, but by the 19th century, the Ural boundary became the standard interpretation, although issues remained because the mountains did not form a complete boundary, forcing some maps to combine the boundary with pieces of the Volga or Don River, or by arbitrarily drawing a line from the end of the Urals to take a turn at the Caucasus Mountains. Issues of continental definitions continued using other criteria as well. English geographer and politician Hartford Mackinder extended Europe to the Sahara on a racial basis, as in his words. It is the desert land that divides the black man from the white. 
1963 edition of Encyclopedia Britannica refers to the region of Pakistan as a region bordering on Europe and Asia, which would place all of Afghanistan within Europe. The previous uses of continent, however, ignored that those audiences had a very different conception of the world than a modern audience. In 1599, one writer called the West Indies, the islands of the Caribbean, a large and fruitful continent. Definitions of continent formed slowly. The English word is derived from the term continent land, Latin terra continens, but wasn't understood in the modern sense, instead referring only to a connected or continuous tract of land and was applied to areas much smaller than modern readers would expect. In the 16th century, writers spoke of the continents of the Isle of Man, Ireland and Wales, and even Sumatra. In the mid-17th century, one geographical writer wrote that a continent is a great quantity of land, not separated by any sea from the rest of the world. In 1727, the Cyclopedia of Ephraim Chambers wrote that the world is ordinarily divided into two grand continents, the old and the new. In 1752, cartographer Emmanuel Bowen defined continent as a large space of dry land comprehending many countries all joined together without any separation by water. Thus, Europe, Asia, and Africa is one great continent as America is another. Many geographers worried about the conception of the three old world continents. In 1680, the English Atlas complained that the division seems not so rational, while many others argued that Europe was only an extension of Asia. By the end of the 1800s, however, the Oxford English Dictionary recounted that formerly two continents were reckoned, the old and the new. Now it is usual to reckon four or five, including North and South America. Australia gets only a brief mention as sometimes reckoned as another. Writers of the increasingly modern period divided the continents on more than physical barriers, with 19th century writer Carl Ritter claiming that each continent was so planned and formed as to have its own special function in the progress of human culture, and to claim each continent had its own race. These writers found reasons to argue for an empirical separation of the continents. Australia posed its own issues. Discovered in 1606, 18th and 19th century atlases disagreed about whether it was a part of Asia or its own continent. In the 18th century, the conception of an Oceania was posted, including not just Australia and minor Pacific islands, but also Polynesia and the Philippines. In The Myth of Continents, the authors write that it was only in the 1950s that Australia began to be firmly described as a continent, and it was World War II that forged the consensus that Indonesia and other islands nearby should be considered Asian. Similarly, before World War II, it was common for American atlases to consider the Americas as a single continent, and only after 1950 did it become common for American atlases to separate North and South America. As early as 1849, an atlas labeled Antarctica as a continent, but the myth of continents authors found that distinction was rare until after World War II. Despite the fact that many of these concepts appear to have a Eurocentric bias, they were applied largely uncritically in other parts of the world. Japan accepted the fourfold continent division in the 1700s. Cartographers in the Islamic world of the Middle Ages generally accepted continents as they found them defined in earlier Greek texts. That isn't to say that other regions didn't have their own forms of centrism. Maps made in India tended to have Central Asia as their center, and at least one labeled a far-off marginal section as England, France, and other hat-wearing islands. Of course, it was colonization that spread the European conception of continents furthest. Other reasons to embrace the scheme have come directly from resistance to Europe, which helped Japanese leaders identify with an Asian identity in the 19th century. Perhaps similarly, Latin American countries usually teach of a single American continent that Latin culture spans. It's valuable to remember that the scientific notion of plate tectonics, often used to argue for particular continental schemes, wasn't conceptualized until well after social definitions of the continents were. Alfred Wegener first suggested his conception of continental drift only in 1912 and the theory received significant resistance and argument between drifters and fixists. Plate tectonics wasn't fully described and generally accepted until the 1960s. The geological and scientific concept of the number of continents can and should be left up to experts in the field, but it's clear that the definition of continent was first and foremost a social definition that until very recently didn't even consider a scientific viewpoint.
even scientific definition, however, struggles to use the term without contradiction, with plates, cratons, and other concepts failing to simplify the matter. While much of the world's education now conforms to the system of seven continents, others still teach six, and some even argue for as few as four continents. Perhaps the most important lesson that we can learn from the history of trying to define the continents is that humans have constantly tried to define the space around us, but no matter what method we've used, the round peg of reality has refused to fit comfortably into the square hole of human convention. Now is the part of the episode where we get to chat with the history guy. A little bit about what we just heard, what we're going to hear, and some behind the scenes stuff you only get to hear about on the podcast. I feel like this episode is one of the most interesting I didn't learn this in school episodes that we have. And I mean, of course, we do forgotten history. So like most of this stuff is stuff that, you know, wasn't learned mm -hmm. in school or, you know, we're aiming at like a different a different perspective. But this one especially is is very we learn this as like this basic agreed upon fact. I mean, it is there's no question there are if you're in the United States, you learn that there are seven continents. And it is amazing how different the history shows that absolutely it is such a revelation a matter of fact even if you were to go back uh to the 1950s uh you know uh, two generations back yeah. uh, they they might have taught this differently but yeah this is i mean there have been uh, actually the, i first started hearing fights just kind of serious fights over this before we made these videos on other videos where someone sa was saying you're counting the count the, the continents wrong so it is interesting how these things that we've been taught as absolute fact are not absolute fact that actually there's not only just disagreement across the world but there's disagreement over time and that they've evolved over time and that things that we consider to be absolute fact today were completely yeah. seen differently in the 1950s it's i mean it's there i learned a lot in this episode by the way josh wrote this particular episode uh and if you, if you didn't know josh writes some of the episodes of the history guy i wrote some of the episodes of the history guy this is one of them that josh wrote so when i get a script from josh i get to learn a lot of new things too and it's it's fun one of the things that's fun of being the history guy is that you uh, i learn all the time uh, if you think I just knew this stuff before I made the video, no. <laughs> I learned it a day ahead of you, and then I put it into a video, and then you find it out. Yeah, and even even the, on stuff that we do sometimes know something about, I always learn a lot more doing the research. It's, it's, it's one of the, it really is one of the great joys of doing this. But the the continents is interesting. I had, I I had known that there was some disagreement over it because I knew that there were. Uh, that there were well, like you said on some of the videos, where they're like, "Oh, well, they didn't cross over that." Yeah, many yeah, that was uh, that was, I think, they... the Pacific Clipper episode. Someone started arguing with how many continents they've been on, and it, it befuddled yeah. me. Not just because I learned it in the American way, but I mean, how from a European perspective, how <laughs> how are Europe and Asia <laughs> different continents, but North and South America aren't? <laughs> That's, I mean, at least. It's pretty obvious yeah. to me. But on the other hand, it turns out even even here in the United States, uh, up until the 1950s, it wasn't accepted that North and South America were two continents. So I, I thought that I thought it, I found it kind of preposterous that he was arguing with. Well, it turns out, you know, probably around second grade, he was taught that as absolute fact, in the same way I was taught that as an absolute fact. And it's it's so interesting that that changes with history, that it changes yeah. with culture, that it really has to do with your perception of the world. It's very similar to how adamant people get in the argument over whether Pluto is a planet. Is that just as, you know, this is, when you were taught this stuff in school, I mean, this is really in the foundation of yeah. everything else is built on that and how much it shakes your whole belief uh, in everything that you've learned on whether North and South America are, are, are separate continents or whether Australia, who, who, who uh, I did not know that until the 1950s, yeah. it really wasn't accepted really until after the Second World War wasn't accepted generally that, yeah. that Australia was a continent. It was just still a, a point of dispute where they, where they would disagree. I, I came from a time before they listed a Southern Ocean. Uh, and so that's that's to me a relative when I learned in school. Uh, yeah. That wasn't that. I mean, there was an Arctic Ocean, but there was not a Southern Ocean, which now is generally considered to be a Southern Ocean. Uh, and so it's it's kind of it's uh, you can yeah. see why people are so adamant about that because it was this is sort of stuff that you learned foundationally very early, and then you can understand why different generations yeah. might not understand each other because uh, so many things that we think to be objective truths turned out to be our cultural beliefs that might alter over time. Yeah, and 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 who knew? We don't learn that stuff unless we're kind of brought face to face with it. Uh, because otherwise, I mean, the, it's one of those things you don't question mm -hmm. it. 
we're we're definitely like you know there are seven continents. I mean, gosh, the the Risk board game has you know the six continents, not counting uh, Antarctica. But it's you, you learn this, and it's like it's such a basic thing that if someone comes to you and says, "Oh, there's not that many continents," uh, it's I you know there's this like cognitive dissonance of of course there are. Oh, what are you an Uh-huh. idiot <laughs> for for not knowing that kind of that kind of thing? But it's interesting, and when you when you really start to look into you know as we did in this episode the history of it, I we really Really learned that this the, the idea that there was a, a geological uh, basic reality to why we call what we call continents continents uh, not really true and you know geologists have lots of ways Yeah, even geologists today don't agree. But this, this, the whole story of this yeah uh, episode really does help you understand that because you can, when you understand that continents were originally drawn by people that were sailing out of Greece and they saw Greece as the center of the world and then they were looking at what's around Greece and yeah. then you get the, and then that uh, the whole idea of continents was decided by religious belief, faith, uh, and the idea that you know that God was going to make things balanced and that you were the center and all that sort of stuff. When you start to understand that, you can see how even today there could be disagreement. Because it all it all starts with where you're standing, and you are the center, and and it goes out from there from how you want to see the world and how you want to believe the world. So we had a, a long I don't know if you remember this one a long argument with a guy who was absolutely sure that the Caribbean was a continent up until the mid '90s. I, I try to remember his it was something like you know the U.S. had told the U.N. That's right. to not have it be a continent, uh, and I mean and that was the Caribbean islands. And Yeah. that, yeah, I don't, I don't know where he was. I don't even really remember exactly where he was coming from. But I mean, he was absolutely sure he believed that that was how the, the things were. Uh, and but also he had been a pilot Yeah. that was flying, you know, in uh, in Central America. Uh, and so uh, it, it all it all comes from your perspective. So it's it's wonderful when you go back and look historically. Not only do you learn a really interesting story and story of development, and it's not just a development of science. It's also a development of society, it's changes in attitudes. It's not that our definition is necessarily more perfect today. It's just that more, I mean, now we're using a map to actually go find your way around the world when they were trying to use a map to explain, you know, theology. Uh, but uh, it's not to say it's necessarily perfect. It still comes to that, you know, that whole idea. And, you know, when you get to Zealandia, which I think is really the culmination of understanding the whole thing about continents, that the, there might be Yeah. a continent that's mostly underwater. Uh, but uh, some, some geographers think that by, you know, by how you look at continents, that makes more sense as a continent. Uh, then that, that really shows why these are, you know, these are really just, you know, biggish concepts. And so, and then you can tie that to so many things. Where does one mountain range end and another mountain range begin? Uh, you know, where does, uh, you know, even the Great Lakes are all connected. So how are they separate Yeah. lakes? Uh, and, you know, we, we just come up with conventions to talk about that sort of stuff. But I mean, you, you could have come up with a different convention. So I really enjoy the, the whole story of this, which is not just to understand that these concepts that we think are objective truth are not necessarily objective truth, but why? Why, when you're looking from different perspectives, you see things from completely different, you know, Yeah. different angles, why you would come up with a whole def different definition of something that should be as obvious as geography. I mean, geography is geography, Yeah. right? You know, we don't... You know, the, 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 Yeah. the, the earth is here and we are here to find it. And yet we still can't agree even over that. And that's, you know, it's fascinating. And ties to so many, you know, we've done episodes on time zones. We've done episodes on a lot of different things that still come down to that. We come up with these ways that we try to define the world. Uh, and someone else, you know, could come up with a completely different way. Uh, and, uh, and those really do represent more who we are than really Yeah. what, what's on the map. And they fit the needs of, you know, the people who are who are making them and making those decisions. Uh, and that's how we see, you know, we see why they're trying to, if the world is supposed to be perfectly ordered, uh, like the, you know, like these religious groups were thinking, then they, they want to make the, the world fit Mm-hmm. into that, you know, that, that kind of framework. And that means you have to, you have to change how some of your, I mean, one of the interesting things was this, this medieval concept that the Nile was the separator between uh, Africa Mm-hmm. and Asia. I mean, I think today most people would find that to be nonsensical. First of all, because the Nile doesn't like actually cut some piece of Africa off. I, like the, there would still be some some part of Africa where you were just drawing a line. Uh, but also, uh, the, the, I, it just seems, it seems like an arbitrary spot. It does, yeah. But the truth is, I mean, is it really any less arbitrary than... Yeah, I mean, if you, I mean, two different ways to see that. I mean, part of that might have been culture. They might have wanted to have been claiming, you know, Egyptian culture as being part of European Yeah. history. But I mean, but what, you know, you have to stand up and be able to look kind of from space to see that the Sinai Peninsula makes a lot more sense than the Nile. 
Uh, whereas if you were walking along yeah. the Nile, you know, the, everything kind of revolves around the Nile. So, I mean, part of that is just, you know, where you were standing. I mean, we have, we have an advantage now because we get to look down. But you can see why when you didn't have that yeah. perspective, why it could as easily say the Nile, because that was more considered a cultural boundary than the, than the Sinai was. Yeah. I was, I was watching a thing that was talking about how the Romans understood maps. And, you know, we always see this picture of, of the Roman Empire at, at its greatest extent. So it has clearly defined borders. And the truth is the Romans may never have really thought of their uh, empire like that. They, they didn't really, uh, most, when you look at, like, actual Roman maps, what few of them we have, uh, they're, they're like lists of, they're itineraries that show you, like, where you would go. And so they may never have really conceived of their, of, you know, how we think of, of empires and countries and stuff, which is lines on a map. They may not have really considered it that way and that's that's pretty alien to it to you know a modern a modern mindset but you can see it when you look at like uh, uh t and o maps which look make absolutely no sense mm -hmm. to a modern audience like how is this a map and yet they were they were very central to how you know how the the middle ages understood uh space and that's why you can look at these middle age maps and be like what the what on earth like i can't even tell where any of yeah. this is but, we, uh, but they were they were not necessarily worried about space yeah and, and they weren't necessarily navigating the globe but also when you don't know about the new world or whatever then you can see why they're just trying yeah. to come up with some sense to how geography could work and you know now we talk about plate tectonics and stuff like that i mean long before that yeah. you're like you know there's got to be some logic or rhyme or reason of why or there's earth here and there's not earth there uh, and so that, then the TNO maps make make a lot more sense. Yeah, and th they're all of us trying to navigate reality. The idea that we didn't want to call, or that I say that I say we, but that there were people who didn't want to call the Americas a continent, and that that's par partially why this this idea of the the West Indies held on is that they didn't they didn't want to admit that you know these 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 other lands that they had never considered as part of in part of their. Uh, their schema are going to have to are going to have to fit into the world somehow because not because you know the, it changed reality but because it changed how they thought about Absolutely. the world and that's I mean that's a really well, interesting was, I mean there was a reason to see it. you didn't want to see that these were equal to Europe in any way because you had to give a reason why yes. you know Europe could conquer them so uh, yeah I mean you can see and also why you know you just had never I mean if if all you know for ten generations it's never been there it's hard to accept that something's there. But then, then you see it moves to a, world, a point where they're saying, well, actually, instead of seven continents or six continents or whatever, it's really new world and old world. Uh, and I don't know where that puts Australia, but uh, yeah. I mean, but I mean, that kind of that kind of actually makes more sense culturally. Uh, and that is actually Africa and yes. Europe have more in common uh, than Africa and Europe have from North and South America in terms of history. And it's I mean, that also influences how, you know, Russia is claiming that they're part of Europe as and that that allowed them to have, you know, these these kind of ideological mm -hmm ideas about how uh, Siberia was a separate place that could be treated differently and could be colonized differently and that's that all makes sense within you know within the understanding it's not it's not just a european thing i don't want to say that it that it just is because there's there are ways that people have used space mm -hmm. to determine that kind of stuff uh, around the world uh, all all people have kind of you know tried to negotiate space as an ideological concept as well as a, a, a re, as a, as a physical one but it's it's interesting how that kind of stuff has changed and mm -hmm. how we did use it and it's also, I mean, ultimately, you know, when we come up with plate tectonics, which is a surprisingly, perhaps surprisingly modern uh, concept, instead of, you know, t taking continents and saying, okay, the whole concept has to change because we now understand plate tectonics, tectonics we've more kind of been like, <laughs> how can we fit plate tectonics into, <laughs> into our the, classic the understanding existing yeah, yeah you know something <laughs> i wonder i mean i would imagine that even you know small hunter-gatherer cultures or whatever they're they have some vision of geography and you know where they are uh, and i imagine it centers around them yeah. and i wonder how they conceive of the lands beyond that i don't know you know polynesians they were sailing all the way across the the, the pacific they must have had some idea yeah. of geography because they're finding their way from island to island but I, I i don't know i mean maybe somebody knows but i don't how do they conceive of, of places they've never been i mean and what would they have thought of when they found out that they were europeans you know uh, i you know i don't know because yeah. their because their vision of the world would have been the world that they understand and it was very broad but i mean they did it to understand even that you know the it might not have even noticed the largest man land mass the stuff we call continents is the stuff they weren't yeah. even looking at Right, because they were traveling from yeah, that, those weren't uh, there. from island to island, and of course, you, whenever you travel the world, you find out that something that's small on a map is a huge, a huge chunk of space. Right? I yeah. mean, you know, the whole world could be Rhode Island. Yeah, even these yeah. tiny islands.
these tiny little islands, uh, we have we have this idea that oh, that they're 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 so small. But I mean, when you actually go to them, you know, they're not they're perhaps not as small. Oh as yeah, yeah. You know, you couldn't you couldn't cross one in a day, and you could you know you could live on one side and not know what's on the other yeah. side. And I mean, stuff that we think of as, as yeah. relatively small. I mean, you know, the Big Island of Hawaii is very large, really. You know, if you I mean, there's yeah. you know, lots of people can live there. Uh, or, or you know, uh, more or less, you know, Great Britain versus the Isle of Man or whatever. So these are these yeah. are not little you know yeah. six person islands. These are islands could stand you know, withstand populations of hundreds, maybe even thousands, uh, and, and so you could see why they saw those as you know essentially a whole a whole world. Yeah, and and but according to you know our continents kind of thing, these were just little marginal mm -hmm. spaces, and it is interesting how that 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 mm -hmm. changes. Uh, and we've we've really seen those changes. It's interesting to see you know this idea of Australia or how this concept of of what we you know what we kind of lump in with Southeast Asia. So I mean you mm -hmm. know Indonesia and uh, the New Guinea and stuff like that. Uh, that we weren't necessarily we weren't necessarily like really sure which continent yeah. they should belong with. And we're I, in some ways we're still not really yeah, I mean, sure. Yeah, you know, there's a convention that you know all the way down into Indonesia that's Southeast Asia, yeah. but it's actually very very close to Australia. And you know, when you go to Australia, you find out that they yeah. they share a lot politically. There's a lot of discussion between them because they're they're very close in yeah. proximity to Indonesia. So how do you how do yeah. you draw a line? You know, and and you know there's most probably not. There's you know it's it's probably more of a Venn diagram yeah. than a line, right? Yeah. And it brings, I mean, it brings into question some stuff. You know, we talk about Turkey being the only country that that exists on two continents, and we talk about that as a fact, as if that's that's like that's a certain fact. And the truth is, here when you look at it, you're like, I mean, it deter, it's all, it all depends on where you want to make that line of the continent, because you know, there's there's the strait through there, but I mean, you could get from one part of Turkey to the other part of Turkey by land. It, you yeah, just sure, have to go around, you know, you have yeah. to go around the. It's interesting. So I, I don't know. We talk about a lot of stuff that we, we kind of think of. Uh, you might even call it, you know, some of that stuff like pedantic uh, trivia uh, that people want to say, oh, well, it's actually this. Well, it's actually that. And what we really find out is that uh, it might depend, uh, which is not, I, I think, as you as you mentioned in the in the next episode, it's not necessarily the most satisfying it's answer, not, but it is. And if you talk to if you talk to locals, it might be very important for them to say that I am part of this as opposed to yes. part of that. But even though they, you know, it's really on a fuzzy yeah. boundary. I mean, if you look, I, I always laughed about yeah. that. We used to ask when you looked at like a highway map, you know, but I remember back in the day when we had actually paper maps, <laughs> folder map, <laughs> you get it yeah. for free at the, at the, at the, uh, uh, at the rest stop. But I mean, you know, what's, what state, the line takes some distance, you know, who's, who does that belong to? Yeah. You know, <laughs> is it in the middle? Is it, you know, so, so I, that we, my brother and I used to argue over that, over, you know, what about the line on the map? Is that, you know, is that Kansas or is that Missouri? Uh, and uh, that's, you know, it, it's, it's really kind of that fuzzy. I mean, we made up these lines. Sometimes they're very clear, the rivers and stuff like that, but also rivers change their course. Yeah. Uh, there's a, there's a really interesting place here in Illinois called Cas yeah. Cascade. Uh, that's, uh, uh, it's, it's in Illinois, but it's part of Missouri because of the way the Mississippi decided to go. Even the, even the things that seem like clear boundaries, are not so clear a boundary. If if yeah. mountains are a boundary, I mean, you know, mountains are wide. You know, it's a is it lined down the the yeah. peak, you know? Uh, yeah. Where exactly? And, and, and we've yeah. had we've had near wars or wars over very you know you, you when you, even when you wrote the treaty you said it went this way and then you say well does that mean this channel or that channel or which channel? Yeah. Well, we we had that we had that. Uh, it, when we talked about the Toledo mm -hmm. War, the whole argument over whether Toledo was in Michigan mm -hmm. or Ohio was all about the fact that they Absolutely. drew the map. So was so was the Honey and... Bee War between uh, uh, Iowa and Missouri, yeah. uh, but so was the uh, uh, the Aristic War up in Maine, uh, and uh, the, yeah. and which really didn't turn into war. And the and the Saint, San Juan Islands out in in Washington, those are all yeah. over that same sort of issue. Yeah. That even when you draw what you think is a clear boundary, then it leads to questions about where that boundary is. And you know, even if it's in the middle of the and channel, what exactly counts as the middle? And is your boat floating across it? You know, so it's well. And if if you if if the shorelines change, you're right. Yeah, does that change, yeah, the so that the change what it is? Or... Yeah, what do you do when them? Because the Mississippi <laughs> yeah. does every once in a while decide it's going to cut off a bend or something like that and say like oh, you know. Yeah. And has done it significantly, you know, in, in modern history that it's changed. Uh, when you actually go look at those lines on, say, like Google Maps, you know, they, they don't follow the river actually uh, anymore. Uh, there are places where they where they don't, and there are all these little uh, what do they call those like exclaves that are separated by the river. And there have there have been uh, you know legal fights over what what that whether mm -hmm. that land should you know should change which state it's in. Or I mean it's a, it's an interesting topic that 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 might have uh, d deserve its mm -hmm. own discussion. But it is you know it's really related to our concept yeah. of how um, it's all. We've also talked about exist. micronations and stuff like that. Those all come down to the same things. That yeah. the whole idea of any of this of stuff that we think is objective.
really is subjective and it depends what you want to do. And that's that's the way that a, a Mansell C4 can see itself as a, as a principality, uh, is the same way that uh, it might be very important if you're in Europe to think that America is one continent. And it might be very important in America to think that it's two continents. And the funny thing is, if you go a generation back, they might have had that flipped. So it's, it's really, it's a fascinating... Uh, and so, I mean, it's funny because we, we draw those as, as these, you know, as these lines and, you know, the yeah. lines. Uh, and it is interesting, like the boot heel of Missouri is there because those people in the boot heel did not want to think of themselves as being uh, from Arkansas. Arkansas, yeah. Arkansas was, was uncivilized. Missouri was civilized. And so we had to create this little chunk of Missouri that's not Arkansas. Yeah. yeah. But which makes it, you know, which is this really uh, identifiable it is. piece. And, and I, I honestly geography. don't know what the people in Little Rock think about the fact that the people over in New Madrid <laughs> didn't want to think of themselves. They didn't yeah, want to be possibly. part of Arkansas. <laughs> <laughs> it's, but, I mean, it was important to someone at some point. And so we draw these kind of crazy lines. And, and so uh, the same thing, you know, it just comes down to continents. And I, I love the discussion, where does Europe begin and where does Asia begin? Uh, is that that's what it's because yeah i mean if you're arguing least... over the nile and the uh, uh and and the the Sinai peninsula i mean i mean that at least you know <laughs> yeah and they talked about you know the don river which i think if you asked most people i, I mean a lot of people today i don't think so i don't know think the people don here river in is. north america have any idea where the don river is more or less to say that it's and you know that was that was supposed to be the dividing line between Europe and Asia. And of course, you know, eventually you learn just like the Nile that it doesn't actually, it doesn't yeah. reach far enough to really fit your, your, your definition. And even the Urals, which people will talk about, you know, as, as the defining line now, uh, we mentioned in the video that there's still a point where you basically have to just draw a line. <laughs> there's no natural border yeah, there point, that yeah, you can just don't connect know. to, you know, where you separate it in the, in the car. And that's kind of hysterical whatever. when you think about it, because whenever you draw that line, I mean, you could have a village with a line going through it and like, you're Asian, <laughs> you know, you, 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 <laughs> you're Asian over you there, know, there and they're and 10 feet away from each other. So, I mean, there are houses that cross the borders. And so when we talk about whole continents on that and to say, you know, obviously, you know, the people that are 10 miles away from you are a different continent and the people that are a thousand miles away from you are the same continent. You know, the, 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 the people in the Caucasus have more yeah. in common with people in, in China than they do with people in, you know, a yeah. uh, hundred miles away, you know, going, going the other direction, going, going west. I, you know, it really, it, so it, it is interesting. It goes back to that first start. We think that the definition of continents is clear and that it's important and it's a basic understanding of geography. Uh, and then when you start to parse that and break it down and look at it historically, uh, it doesn't make any sense. It's just, it's, it's something that we do to, to yeah. you know, kind of create a, a way to understand the world. But I mean, the world doesn't care. The world never really thought about that, right? I mean, the, you know, the animals yeah. wander across those borders all the time. They don't much, they don't much mind. Which ha we have problems with these days on, you know, whether they want to migrate through a, through a national border. Yeah. And <laughs> we want to keep that border. Oh, yeah, yeah I guess so we, do, we, we do have those issues. It reminds me, we did a little episode on something called the SS Waramu, too, that supposedly at the turn of the, of the, yeah. of the 19th to 20th century. You know, you've got these invisible lines, the, the equator, the, 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 the tropics, the time zones. We've got all these, you know, crazy invisible lines the dateline so if you if you so if you, if you straddle the dateline then your boat's in two different days which could if you did that on the right time it could be in two different years and two different months and two different yeah and it's all this an invisible line you know the fish down there going what's that boat doing here in the middle of nowhere you know <laughs> so you know, there's, there's there's fish swimming back between monday and tuesday every day of the week and they don't care <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had, it, people had a big argument about we didn't, you know, we didn't have satellite imagery that couldn't be in the right spot or whatever. Like, well, as far as they knew, it, it, by their standard, they were in the right spot. So we have a different standard for what's the right spot now. But it was all pretty meaningless because where they were, you know, the the, the sun, which supposedly determines, you know, day and night and stuff yeah. like that, stayed in the same place regardless. Yeah, of yeah. The sun doesn't care that. about that line either. <laughs> uh, and it, when they were doing it uh, from uh, from uh, 1899 to 1900, when actually technically the century didn't start until yeah. 1901. So, <laughs> so I mean, it's all this art. It's all this stuff that we made up, and then we sit and argue over it. And it, you know, you're, and you talk about this. Yeah. Oh, well, this is just a boat floating and bobbing in the middle of the ocean, like any other spot in the ocean. Yeah. And that's. What we're really arguing about is our is our definitions, and you know. So when we say technically, uh -huh. yeah, yeah, technically, and 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 but you can get angry because you learned it this way in school and they learned it that way in school, and so if you wonder why we, you know, why we fight over borders and stuff, I and mean, there's a lot there's a lot that goes onto it. But I mean, we you know we've essentially fought wars over the same thing, you know, I mean, you know, differently differently. But I mean, humans have been fighting over invisible lines since humans have been humans. <laughs>
So thank you for listening to the History Guy podcast. Uh, this podcast is supported by a lot of things, but it, it costs money to produce the History Guy, both the YouTube channel and, of course, this podcast. And one of the ways that we you know, really support this and are able to continue to produce our vision of kind of bringing history to the masses, especially, you know, forgotten history, is through pay channels like Patreon. Yes, we have, and there are multiple ways that we have pay channels if, uh, if for some reason you don't prefer, we find out some people prefer some ways than others, but our primary piece goes through Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N uh, dot com slash the history guy, and we've had that for many years. Uh, and it's a way that you can come in and just uh, help to support history and what we do here at The History Guy because it costs money and it costs some effort to put these together. So if you believe that history deserves to be remembered for just, say, 3 or $5 a month, uh, you'll get some extra access to The History Guy. We do some extra things that we do for our Patreon channel, but it's really a way for you to help us fund things like the podcast. We believe in history. Uh, everybody knows, of course, you're talking here. My son Josh works for the channel, and he's largely paid through the money that we get to those channels that allows us to do much more in terms of producing content, including these podcasts. Uh, very, very grateful, and of course, at whatever level that you support, we have some gifts that we send you, including our, our uh, History Guy Challenge coins, which we do every year. Uh, so it, it really, uh, all I can say is that if, if you think that what we're doing here has value, uh, then this is a way for a fairly small investment. You can support that value. And you might get to see pictures of the cats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, you will get some inside look at stuff that we're doing uh, with with the history guy, uh, and uh, especially when you know when I'm off traveling and then we're filling uh, in with uh, things like our supercuts, which are fun to do. But uh, so usually I'll be giving you an update about where I am that week when when we're traveling along, uh, and uh, sometimes we create some exclusive content for Patreon, and uh, when we have embedded ads, which we also do, it's another way that we pay bills. Uh, then you get a version on Patreon that doesn't include those. So if you if you don't want to watch the ad for whoever's sponsoring this that week, you get ad-free versions that come out on Patreon. Uh, and so it's it's a great way for you to be able to get just a little bit, you know, cleaner version of the History Guy. Uh, and in exchange for that, you pay for a fairly small amount. Then you support the whole idea. The history deserves to be remembered and help us produce the content that helps to keep that history uh, so that so that, you know, everybody can enjoy it. Next up, the history guy tells the history of the seven seas. Arr, as any good fan of the history guy knows, all good stories involve pirates, those dangerous rogues who plied their evil trade across the seven seas. But what exactly are the seven seas? The term actually well predates the golden age of piracy, and like many things in history, the answer might not quite be what you expect. It is history that deserves to be remembered. Seas are not necessarily easily definable bodies. Merriam-Webster has several definitions, including a great body of salt water that covers most of the earth, as well as a body of salt water of second rank, more or less landlocked. The United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea defines all of the ocean as sea. Thus, anyone in the Atlantic can said to be at sea, even if they are on a body of water called a sea. Usually a sea is salt water, but the Sea of Galilee is a freshwater lake, and the Caspian and Arl Seas have also been referred to as large lakes. As definable sections of the ocean, marginal seas are usually mostly separated from the ocean by land, like the Mediterranean Red and Black Sea, but that definition also includes bodies of water not generally called seas, such as the Gulf of Mexico and the Hudson Bay. There is no strict definition. Various bodies of water are called seas, from the Philippine Sea and the Coral Sea to the current-bound Sargasso Sea, the landlocked Caspian Sea, the not-quite-separate Red Sea, or the Mediterranean Sea, itself made up of various smaller seas, such as the Aegean and the Adriatic Seas. By any definition, there are clearly more than seven seas on any modern map. The earliest known reference to the Seven Seas dates to a hymn from the ancient Sumerians, dated to around 2300 BC. Among the earliest poets to have their name recorded to history, Inhejuana wrote to a Sumerian moon deity, O house, your shining face is the great snake of the reed marsh, your foundation, O shrine, the fifty abzus, the seven seas, has plumbed the inner workings of your prince. The matter of what precisely the poet meant by these terms is not exactly clear as much as the context has been lost. Abzu means something like deep waters, likely fresh waters, while the seven seas may refer instead to salt waters. 
Whether they referred to some kind of metaphorical seas or actual seas is not certain. The Greeks may have taken the idiom from early Mesopotamian cultures, although the exact route is impossible to determine. What is certain is that the Greeks had their own version of the seven seas, this relating to their own seafaring knowledge. According to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the seven Greek seas were the Aegean, Adriatic, Mediterranean, Black, Red, and Caspian seas, along with the Persian Gulf. But there were other seas known to the Greeks as well, such as the Tyrrhenian Sea and the Ionian Sea, and sometimes their lists differed. Confusing things further, Roman historian Pliny the Elder, writing in the first century, defined the seas completely differently. The Po River, the longest river in Italy, discharges into a series of salt marshes on the coast of the Adriatic Sea, separated by sandbars from the main body of water. All those rivers and trenches were first made by the Etruscans, thus discharging the flow of the river across the marshes of the Etriani, called the Seven Seas, or Septum Maria. These were bodies of water that had to be crossed to reach Venice, which is likely part of the reason why historian Frederick Chapin Lane says the expression to sail the Seven Seas was applied to the Venetians long before they sailed the oceans. The ancient Persians took a similar route when they identified their Seven Seas to mean various major rivers in Central Asia. In Judaism, the Babylonian Talmud refers to its own set of seven seas and four rivers which surround Israel, the seas of Tiberias, Sodom, Hiltha, Sibke, Aspamia, and the Great Sea, which corresponds to the Sea of Galilee, the Dead Sea, the Red Sea, Lake Ram, Lake Hula, and the Mediterranean, although the Sea of Aspamia does not seem to exist today. Ancient Arabs also had their own list of seven seas, these being the seas they traveled through in trade routes when they went east. In the ninth century, an Arab author wrote that whoever wants to go to China must cross seven seas, each one with its own color and wind and fish and breeze, completely unlike the sea that lies beside it. The seas corresponding to the modern Persian Gulf, the Arabian Sea, the Bay of Bengal, the Strait of Malacca, the Singapore Strait, the Gulf of Thailand, and the South China Sea. These seas were referred to often in Arabian literature, although they were not necessarily the only bodies of water that Arabs called seas. In fact, the term seven seas was not limited to Europe and the Middle East, but was used by other cultures as well. In Hinduism, when the world was created, it was made with seven continents, are surrounded severally by seven great seas. Unlike the seas of other cultures, the Hindu seas were legendary, included seas of salt water, sugar cane juice, wine, clarified butter, curds, milk, and fresh water. Some versions have slightly different lists, but there are always seven bodies in Hindu cosmology. According to the 1928 Nuggets of Knowledge by George Stimson, the seven seas are referred to in the literature of the ancient Hindus, Chinese, Persians, Romans, and other nations. For him, the Hindus applied the name to bodies of water in the Punjab. China actually presents a different theory of the seas, however, and an ancient name for China is the land between four seas, representing a metaphorical boundary for Chinese territory. Each of those seas represents a compass direction, and the easiest to identify are the East China Sea to the east and the South China Sea to the south, while the other two were metaphorical but eventually identified with Lake Baikal in the north and various lakes to the west, like Lake Singhai and Lake Balkash, or even possibly the, the Persian Gulf. As exploration and understanding grew and changed, so did the definition of seven seas. In Europe, the Middle Ages saw various definitions that, of course, differed from the original Greek seas from which they borrowed the term and grew to include some lists like the Atlantic Ocean, the Arabian Sea, the Baltic Sea, and the North Sea, in addition to the Black Mediterranean Red Seas, and decisions over whether seas like the Adriatic counted were far from decided. The age of exploration further complicated any simple definition, with some early modern writers choosing the Atlantic Ocean, Pacific Ocean, Indian Ocean, Arctic Ocean, and throwing in the Mediterranean and Caribbean Sea along with the Gulf of Mexico. The logic of such definitions quickly falls apart with much scrutiny, but nonetheless writers would attempt to fit new knowledge into the schema of the ancient idiom. British colonial tea clippers could claim to cross seven seas on their routes from China to England through the Banda Sea, the Celebs Sea, the Java Sea, South China Sea, Sulu Sea, and the Timor Sea. In any and all of the above definitions throughout time, the term seven seas could be read less literally and more in common usage to simply mean many seas or all the seas.
a captain who had sailed the seven seas may never have been expected to name what those seas were, but simply be understood to be an expert sailor who had sailed to faraway islands. The number seven has traditionally been considered lucky or sacred in many cultures, reflected in famous sevens like the seven wonders of the world. The medieval understanding of seven liberal arts, seven days in a week, seven sands, and seven heavenly bodies, being the planets plus the sun and the moon, which were easy to see with the naked eye in antiquity. Ancient Egypt had seven paths to heaven, and Osiris traveled through seven halls in the underworld, and the Sumerians had seven domes that made up the heavens. In many parts of the world, cats have seven lives, not nine, and in Hippocratic medicine, the number seven rules illnesses of the body. The number seven is considered more pervasive than that and covers everything from seven layers of purgatory to the seven voyages of Sinbad, another old story telling of journeys on the so-called seven seas. As the early modern era turned modern, curious people the world over wondered what the seven seas were and asked anyone who would listen. The term was especially popularized following the publication of Rudyard Kipling's 1896 collection of poems, The Seven Seas. That work led to hundreds of questions wondering what exactly those seven seas everyone had heard so much about were. The Seven Seas magazine in 1915 wrote directly to Kipling, asking him where he had taken the name. Kipling thought that the expression was a very old one and traced it to the work of Omar Khayyam, a 10th century Persian poet and polymath, from a 19th century English translation. Another reader suggested the name came from a Hawaiian song written down in the 1820s by British missionary William Ellis, which talks of the eight seas, the channels which separate the Hawaiian islands. Various other experts and trivia collectors sought to answer the question as well. In a 1930 edition of the Aspen Times, a writer listed several sets of seven seas. His list of Greek seas included the Tyrrhenian, Ionian, and Sardouam seas west of Sardinia. He also lists seven seas east of the Suez, the Caspian, Arl, Akosk, Japan, China, and Arabian, and Red Seas. In Polynesia, he lists seven more, and in the Western Hemisphere includes the Bering Sea, Beaufort Sea, Greenland Sea, Lincoln Sea, Baffin Sea, Caribbean Sea, and the Yucatan Channel. His sources are unknown. In 1921, the Pittsburgh Daily Post cites the Roman tale of the seven seas near Venice. Another writer simply threw up their hand saying, I do not believe Kipling or anyone else knows what he meant by the term. A later invention declares there are five oceans and seven seas. The original isn't clear except that it combines the modern understanding of five oceans with the ancient idiom, and what those seven seas are isn't any more clear. As for how the term became so closely associated with pirates, that's even less clear. The phrase doesn't appear in Treasure Island, nor a general history of the pirates of 1724, but by 1953, the movie Raiders of the Seven Seas put the term firmly among pirates. The most likely connection seems simply to be that pirates quickly turned to legends, and they were already deeply associated with the sea. Only the most experienced pirates could have traveled so far as to see all seven, whatever seas those might have been. Today, people still wonder about the names of the seven seas, and the answer that it depends might not always be satisfying. Seems the idiom has outlived its original purpose, except I guess that it's always meant a lot of water. In fact, modern definitions take a lot of fun out of it. There are dozens of bodies of water that are now called seas, and dozens more that could be by various definitions. A modern seven seas often refers to no sea at all. In the 1957 book of the seven seas, author Peter Fritchen says that everybody talks about the seven seas, but hardly anyone can name them. It is a very old phrase, and a very new one too. And in between, no one tried to count. He goes on to give a modern definition that separates the Atlantic and the Pacific into northern and southern sections in addition to the Indian, Arctic, and Southern Oceans, and that's probably a list that most of us can agree on if you insist on being literal. But no matter what definition you use, and no matter what period in history you lived, it is still impressive to be able to claim that you have sailed the seven seas. And I'll be true to any man as long as he's ashore. You know, these two episodes are uh, are very, very similar. They talk about different things, but it's both about geography. And I think it's interesting uh, some of the similarities that are in them. And there's also some differences, of course.
Yeah. Well, I mean, because I think people are relatively more sure of what's set in terms of what the continents are. Yeah. The seven seas has always been a bit metaphorical, uh, but then that also gives you this, you know, this broad vision then of uh, we continue to use the seven and the seven seas and everybody has a different concept of what the seven seas are. And again, it tells you so much about the culture and the history of it uh, that, you know, of course, the Greeks, the seven seas were all, you know, around Greece. Uh, yeah. And today you will still hear people say that they have sailed the seven seas. Uh, and uh, again, if you were to ask which seven C's, you would probably get numerous answers. <laughs> so it is, I mean, this one's very fun, uh, uh, whimsical to hear what everybody thought the seven C's might be. And, yeah. and uh, But it also tells you a lot about cultures. It tells you a lot about history and how we preserve that. And I think maybe some people are surprised to find out that that term, the seven C's, has never really meant specifically any seven C's. It is that it's only ever been really a metaphor that you're sailing, you know, sailing the ocean. Even when they, you get back to Greece, their, their various listings of seven seas mm -hmm. make it clear that the terms seem to exist before, uh, before they had identified the seas. And so they're, they're, the lists differ. And uh, they have, a, sea is kind of a, it's, it's not a very clear term. And yeah, that's, it, I mean, to that extent, it's like yeah. continent. I mean, what, yeah. what makes a sea, is, there's no real clear definition of what makes a sea, so you can't, but you can see why, you know, the Aegean Sea was seen as yep. its independent, independent piece. And then, you know, broader, you can see why we see the Mediterranean Sea, even though it's connected to the Atlantic uh, and actually connected to the Indian Ocean now, the, yeah. uh, 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 that, uh, that you could see why you would see the Seven Sea uh, or the, the Mediterranean Sea is different. But then, but then, you know, why is the Gulf of Mexico not its own yeah. sea by that definition? And then you start to see how strange it is. Yeah, you know, are the Great Lakes inland seas? We call them lakes, but they're as big as some of the things that people call seas. You know, my favorite, I mean, when you understand especially that, that seven has specific, you know, meaning and that we're yeah. probably just using the word seven because it has that specific meaning. But my favorite is the, uh, the uh, Indian tradition, which says that they're one of the seven seas is made from clarified butter. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and milk, too. But, I mean, the yeah. clarified butter sea is the, is the one, I mean... Oh, yeah. you know, do, that do one, I guess. There? I guess you would say. Well, I, I don't know if you, you know, if you were speaking to the Hindus, if those are, if those were literal seas, um, in you know, in any sense. But they, they certainly are <laughs> I don't not so. seas that I don't we think could ever, sail. Ever in. anybody claim that there was a literal sea of clarified butter? <laughs> I think that was always seen. That was always as a, as a. Yeah, a spiritual realm or, you know. Yeah, yeah. Co cosmological in some sense. I don't think uh, anybody ever came back in a boat and said, I just rode through the sea of clarified butter. You know, no, I don't think that's but, true. They, they, you know, some of the differences, I think it's interesting that the, the like, the Muslim traders uh, had seven seas that you'd travel on your way mm -hmm. to China. And mm -hmm. the, that description that you give where it t talks about, oh, they're all different. And, like, the color of the sea and the fish and the birds, you know, like we talked about with, with the continents, uh, you, exactly where those lines are is not very clear. And yet, you know, still, no, but, they but seem to think... probably still had geographic importance. It yes. probably did have something with navigation and helping to actually, you know, find the Far East and get back. Uh, and so they might not have had a line, we cross from this sea to this sea to this sea, but they probably had some vision that says yeah. that, you know, we have passed through, you know, the, the areas that we have to pass through to get to where we're going. So, I mean, it's interesting. And, you know, they navigators might have been deliberately somewhat obtuse as well, though, sure. because that was propri proprietary to them. That was their business. Uh, and so that it might have been done so it's easier to remember, but it also might have been done so that it was imprecise enough that you would, you know, need to earn their expertise in order to do it. Yeah. And have but it still shows that or... you know the culture of it and the history of it, and you know it's funny. It's funny to me today that we will still use the term today because it just shows that culturally it's so embedded uh, that even though we can we can you know readily admit that there are, there are hundreds of named seas uh, that we still say and yeah. we use the term seven. Seas. I've never heard anybody say I've I've sailed the seven hundred seas. No, right? Uh, no, no one says. No. Uh, there's there's maybe someone who has tried to count which seas they've been in, but like you said, you know, with the Gulf of Mexico, which seems by mm -hmm. uh, by most definitions, certainly it seems to be as much of a sea as say, you know, the Philippine Sea, which yeah. is which is not you know not it's not uh, as landlocked to say the Mediterranean, which only has you know the the Strait and the you know now the canal. But uh, it's it's somewhat the Gulf of Mexico is somewhat similar to the Mediterranean yeah. though, and, and, and it really true. Is, you know this yeah, I mean, and 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 it, size wise, it's you know it's it's yeah. very large. Uh, but, uh, you know, like the Hudson Bay, why, you know, yeah. uh, why, that would be in other standards of sea. No? Yeah, and then we have. I mean, yeah. we have gulfs, and uh, and there are definitions. If the, if the Aral Sea and the Caspian Sea are seas, because yeah. there's all those inland lakes, then why aren't Lake Superior and Lake Michigan yeah. seas? 
Yeah, what what what's the and the truth is there is no there's no real definition there. If you were to ask someone, you know, how big does a lake have to get to become a sea? Uh, the answer is I don't know. <laughs> that, that we call some lakes lakes and we call some lakes seas. Well, and, they and they call the you know the Sea of Galilee a sea, even though I mean mm -hmm. it's it is by any uh, any definition or really you know size wise it's way smaller than. Uh, than the like Great the Lakes. Caspian sea, or yeah. the Great Lakes, yeah. Yeah. It's, but I mean, it's, it's large enough that you, you know, it has, it has weather, it has, you know, uh, yeah. and you, you, you know, go out in boats and fish on it. And so, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I can see why you, when you, I mean, anyway, if you look at it from the start, if you look at it from, you know, this is where my culture is born, this is what we do, and you go off the boats, and, you know, some of the boats come home, and some of them don't. It reminds me of, if you remember the old civilization game, you'd, yeah. You'd make a tri beam and send it out there, and it would just go, and you'd never see it again. <laughs> uh, and so you can see why, you know, they start calling, I mean, these things are large, even, you yeah. know, even relatively small lakes look like large bodies of water from a boat, and, and why you start to, so that line between what's a sea and what's a lake, and then, you know, what is a sea is a part of an ocean, but a part of an ocean that you traverse, you know, in a specific way, so that's yeah. why you would have, you know, the Aegean Sea where, you know, the islands are and stuff like that. Uh, you, can, you can see how that starts, you know, from your original perspective as a seafarer, uh, but then uh, as it as it goes on as we get a broader and broader vision even the point where we look at the whole world now we're still yeah. using the term uh, and it's kind of you know it, it's it's just a it's a fascinating history but it also like we talked about with the continents it's one of those where people can sit and completely disagree yeah. over whether that's a sea and whether they have sailed a sea and you could make all kinds of definitions but like with the continents one of the one of the problems that crops up is whatever your definitions are are <laughs> Our current, uh, you know, the current system we have, the things we call seas, uh, you can't find you can't find a definition that will like absolutely uh, fit all of those and not things that we don't say are seas. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. It's very, very much so. There's, there's yeah. again, we, you know, when if this is a sea, why is this not a sea? Uh, and if they're all seas, then you know how many seas are there? Yeah, that's not not always clear because by a lot of definitions, like we said, the Gulf or the the Hudson Bay. Oh yeah, and these are all or things the Persian that would be Gulf. Or, yeah. I mean, there's there's lots of them that, that could be called seas. Yeah, and just and just aren't for one reason or another. Uh, but that, I mean, it reminds me too of the idea. You know, when the continents won, they they talk about Australia as the world's biggest island and also the world's smallest continent. That's an interesting thing to say that mm -hmm. we know but when you really look at it you're like oh, what what exactly makes you know why is it an island in asia not <laughs> all <Yeah>. of <laughs> what yeah. what exactly makes what makes australia uh, an island and a continent and the, the truth is we just kind of we kind of said it was so <laughs> yeah uh, well you know it's of the of the sort of traditional vision of the continents yeah. it's the smallest of the continents yeah. and so i guess uh, but i mean certainly it's much bigger than madagascar True. right uh, and and which then again gets the definition because often a sea is simply the spot that goes between two yeah. islands, two sizable islands, and so they'll say that. Uh, the, as a matter of fact, I don't know is the Strait between Madagascar and Africa is that called a sea? Oh, that's a good question. Um, that is a good question. Here it's called the Mozambique Channel. The Mozambique Channel that would be awfully large for a channel. So again, yeah. you know, we've got all these multiple ways that we want to yeah. that we want to. But that's you know the the Pacific. One of the one of the interesting things when I made a map when we did this episode uh, and just like listed a bunch of seas. I'm, I'm not even sure I could say that I listed quote all of the seas. <laughs> I listed a lot of them. But yeah, the the Southeast Asia has all of those islands that separate various mm -hmm. various bodies of water, uh, which are of course technically connected, but uh, mm -hmm. are separated by various things. And there are they're a all, lot. They're all, they're technically connected. They're all in the Pacific. I mean, you're right. They're all in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, but then you get you get to say you've got like the Banda Sea and the Java Sea and the yeah. Celebes well, Sea. Well, between like the South China Sea is quite large, and from yes. continents that was that was the southern end of China, uh, yeah. right? But I mean, yes, why is yes. why is the Barents Sea a sea, and you know, south of the Barents Sea ocean and not sea? I mean, I, yeah, you know. there's not really a there's not really a definition there that makes that clear. But it's it's cool, and I, I like again you can see in this one where they. Uh, and this is, you know, another way where these these two topics have really connected. You can see where we just keep trying to fit uh, what we now know into this these old systems, mm -hmm. and so that's how you get. Oh, what are the seven seas? And people start listing oceans, and it's it's not. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, and that's what you would come up with at the end. Someone essentially takes what you've got the you know the oceans. You cut the Atlantic, the Pacific in half, and then you have the yeah. and, and, and you come to. But then that, you know, there's no difference between an ocean and a sea at that point. Yes. Uh, and I mean, there are specific reasons why it's meaningful to talk about places like 
like the Barrett Sea yeah. and the Indian, the Aegean Sea and the Sargasso Sea. And I mean, those are those are there was really a specific reason that you called that where it was because it was important that you knew where you were. Uh, and so that I mean, the term certainly has has use, right? Yeah, and, you know, we've talked about. I mean, you know, yeah, it, it's really interesting. We talked, for example, about the Aral Sea, which almost went dry, and now they're now they're they're refilling. You know, uh, it, I mean, there's. The idea that this was large enough that they thought of it as a sea. Well, if you're walking up on the shore, of course you would think it was large enough to see. Yeah. So we shouldn't we shouldn't forget that uh, the you know the meaning of that history. And it's I mean that's, it a, is, that's we, a cultural thing. Went, and... Yeah, I mean wherever you went and whenever you went, you had a whole different vision of what yeah. you know what what the local seas were. And but you know, we still kept coming up with the number seven. That's that's yeah. And that's I mean seven is one of those numbers. Although you could look at a lot of numbers like that. There's there's mm-hmm. a lot of sevens, and we we choose that number for various reasons. It is interesting that that's a number that seems to have uh, kind of gone over and through and around cultures. It's not just like one culture's mm-hmm. thing. Like a lot of cultures use these numbers. And, and it seems it seems particularly tied though too also to uh, uh, maritime. I yes. mean that's uh, and that's True. and so, so for some reason it's always applied there. So I mean you know it's no no coincidence that it was seven voyages of Sinbad. So yeah. I mean uh, yeah so we we clearly have always had that kind of vision vision in our head. Yeah. And it's it's it is really interesting, and I I liked learning about just the fact that we have all these different kinds of seas. I remember as a kid trying to look through and like name seven seas, and because I'm like, uh-huh. well, what are the seven seas? I mean, you start looking at a globe, and you see you know the Sea of Japan, the Yellow Sea, and then I remember looking for like I'm like, are there seven colored seas? Like there's a yellow sea and a red sea, <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> and a black sea, right? and a black so, sea, yeah. right? So I'm like, are there seven yeah. of those? Um, and I I don't think so, but I'm not sure there might be. <laughs> I couldn't name so, you so, all. I don't think the, there's a blue sea, which you think there would be, or a green sea, which I mean, if there. Yeah, I don't think there's there's either one of those. I don't think there's like a white sea. Um, I don't. I, I was just saying because you know the color of water. You yeah, it should be a blue, blue sea, a, right? We would have done a blue or a green first. That's because we say you sail the ocean blue, but actually when you look at the ocean, it, it appears yeah, more yeah. green. But uh, yeah, I. I <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know how exactly, yeah. <laughs> but it's it's a really interesting way of, of kind of seeing how we've culturally kind of come to understand geography. And today, I think we have a very, we kind of separate geography from, uh, I mean, it's still very important culturally, but we're able to try to separate it because, you know, we've got globes and maps and we, we kind of mm-hmm. take our ability to um, figure out where we are and where we're going and what it looks like from above. I think we kind of take that for granted. And, you know, now we're in a position uh, that that's so easy to do. But for most Mm -hmm. of human history, um, even if you, even if, you know, when we started to get really good at drawing coastlines and, Mm -hmm. and we could actually, you know, draw a coastline and it looks relatively like what our modern maps look like, it was (laughs) difficult for them to imagine looking at it from above. Because how could they? They never, you know, they were never above it. Yeah. I mean, try to, I mean, try, it's difficult. Just walk your neighborhood and then try to think of that as a map from above. Uh, And when, then when you see a picture, you find out actually things are a lot more curvy when you walk, when you think they're going in straight lines. It's it's interesting, and I think that it's I, I I just think this is a really interesting way of looking at how we kind of have have na- navigated uh, the mm-hmm. our our relationship with that, and of course the oceans have always and all kinds of water has always been a really significant part of many cultures, and how they have I mean how they have traveled, how they have traded, mm-hmm. it's how we moved stuff around. I mean for most of human history, the best way to get around and the fastest way to get around was going to be by mm-hmm. boat, either you know down a river and or a lot of the episodes we talked about, you know, yeah. cats were important because they kept yeah. the rats from eating your food and your and your. Uh, but uh, so yes, I mean we've always used the oceans and the seas and the waterways, and there's always have been critical ways that we move goods, and so we you know they have a lot of cultural importance to it. Yeah. And so I think this is another episode, you know, where we talk about what mm-hmm. we didn't learn in school. No one ever taught you what the seven seas were, and apparently mm-hmm. that's because no one knows. No one knows. Yeah, we have we have all sorts of, and you know, it uh, it's great as historians because uh, we can talk a lot about a lot of every sea has a history, and we, and we get a good chance to talk about. It. We did a good episode about the uh, Coast Guard Cutter Glacier, which was an icebreaker down in the Weddell Sea, uh, and I think there's a couple seas uh, off of Antarctica that are the same thing, where it's just kind of a gulf. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, there's different behaviors in weather. It still has has meaning there. But yeah, uh, yeah, I don't know. You can say you sailed the seven seas until you've been in the Weddell Sea. <laughs> yeah, I don't think the Weddell Sea usually, in winter. Those guys can really make that. a claim. Those guys that were on the glacier stuck <laughs> there in the middle of the ice in the middle of winter. Uh, but I mean, they, you know, that the, there's a pretty radical difference between that sea and and you know other seas. And so I yeah. mean, it, it, it gives a great opportunity to talk about them because uh, each sea got its name for a reason, and yeah. that reason is history that serves to be remembered.
Thank you for listening to this episode of the History Guy podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Forgotten History, and if you did, you can find more on our website, thehistoryguy.com. We release podcasts every two weeks, so stick around if you want to hear more podcasts of Forgotten History. You can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Patreon. You can even get a personalized message from the History Guy himself on Cameo.